Hey guys, so you may have seen I recently posted a video of playing a Bach cello suite on this Voyager here. And I figured since I already have it set up and I have the patch made, I would just quickly go over how I made the patch and what is in it. Let's quickly go over the front panel of the Voyager in general, just to give you a sense for how it's architected. Very common for analog subtractive synths to have this architecture, and it's very similar to the Minimoog as well. So over here, you have your modulation stuff. So you have an LFO here, and then you have these two modulation buses, which I'll go over in a sec. Then you have three oscillators, and my third oscillator is actually dead. I've had it repaired a couple of times, and it keeps dying on me. So <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on here, but the Voyager is super heavy, so I kind of hesitate to go get it repaired again. Then you have your mixer here, which has a bunch of different channels. So you have your three oscillators get mixed, you have a noise source that gets mixed, and then you have an external input, which you can plug in the back. Then you have your standard uh, Moog low-pass filter, and it's actually a dual filter in this case. You can either pick two low-pass filters or a low-pass and a high-pass, and then you can spread it over stereo. So this synth actually has a stereo output, so you can actually spread the spectrum a little bit with the spacing knob here. And finally, you have two different envelopes, one for volume, one for filter. Finally, you have your output, so headphones and master output here. So that's basically it. And then the keyboard is really nice and it has aftertouch. And that's one of the main reasons why I picked this synth in particular for this piece, because I really love the, f the feel of the keyboard. It's one of the best keyboards I've tried on any synth, really. Probably the best, uh, if I was to go as far as that. Because I don't. there's something about the way it feels. It just feels very natural. And then combination with the aftertouch, which is also really nice. Assigning aftertouch to vibrato is one of the best things, in my opinion, when you're performing, especially kind of solo lead patches, which this piece kind of requires because it's a solo cello piece. All right, so now that we have a flavor for how the architecture of the synth works, let me quickly go over which settings I have for this particular patch. So let's start off with the modulation buses. So the way it works on the Voyager here is that you have a source, a destination, a controller, and an amount. So the source is the thing that will generate the modulation, like an LFO or something. Destination is what you want to assign it to to control. Controller is what controller you want to use to create the amount of modulation. So either the velocity, how hard you hit the keyboard, or after touch, how much you press it afterwards, and other things like the mod wheel, etc. And then the amount is kind of the global amount. And you have two of those to select different kinds of modulation. So the two I have set up here are primarily to do with performance. So one of them I've assigned filter cutoff to the mod wheel here, and that's mod one here. So the source is set to on, destination set to filter, the controller set to mod wheel, and then amount I've maxed it to the complete max. So effectively I have full control over the filter cutoff here, as you can see. And this is what allowed me to get those kind of funky sounds. And this is the part that a lot of people didn't quite like. So in retrospect, I probably could have reduced the amount here to make it a little more subtle rather than having this like crazy funky. And when you exaggerate it, you get almost like a duck quacking effect, which could be a bit comical <laughs> if perceived in the wrong way. I love it in the low end though. For example, at the end of the first section, you kind of end on this low D here. So I love kind of accentuating that at the end of that section. But yeah, it can get a little comical, especially if I'm moving it too fast. Like. So moving on to the second mod bus, what I have here is I've assigned aftertouch to vibrato. And the way to do that is the source, you pick an LFO. So I'm using the LFO to modulate the pitch. Destination, I set it to pitch, and that's how you get the vibrato effect. And then controller, you set it to pressure, which is aftertouch in this case. And the amount, I have it very subtle because vibrato, you don't want it to be heard like wah, 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 wah. You want it to be just a little bit of vi vibration. So let me demonstrate that. So if this is with no pressure, and if I press down, So this is very subtle and it kind of adds um, a little bit of when you're holding a note, you can kind of press it down to add a little more life to it. 
Um, and this is common when you hear cello pieces. A lot of times you'll get vibrato as they kind of, towards the end of bowing, they will ac accentuate a note with whoop, 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 whoop. So that's, that's, that allows me to also kind of perform it that way. And then combination with the mod wheel, you get two sets of expression. One is sort of the tone with this mod wheel, which opens up the sound. And then the other is vibrato, which gives a little more life. Otherwise, the sound would be too static. All right, so that's it for the modulation section. Again, I'm primarily using it as a performance thing. All right, moving on here to the sound section. So the oscillators, like I mentioned, my oscillator three is dead, so I'm not using that. So I'm using the first two oscillators. They're both on. So the first one is set to 16 foot, the second one to eight foot. The first one is sort of a sawtooth, uh, a little more towards the triangle. So like if you're not familiar, the Voyager has a continuous wave shape knob. So instead of flicking and switching between waves, you're kind of morphing between triangle, sawtooth, square, and pulse. And in this case, I have a little less than sawtooth for the first one. And the second one, I have it as a triangle because I didn't want the sound to be too harsh and too much like... I didn't want it to be obvious that there were two oscillators. I just wanted to use the other oscillator just add a little more harmonic content. So if I bring that up here, I can show you before, and if I turn off oscillator two, very subtle, you almost don't notice it, but it's adding a little bit of triangle. So if I morph this to a saw wave, you hear it becomes too much like a wave. Hold on, let me tune it a little bit here. The Voyager needs a little bit of time to warm up here. And finally, again, skipping oscillator three, I've added a tiny bit of noise, again, very subtle. If you add too much noise, it, it starts to sound like there's noise. So I just wanted to add a little bit of noise just to dirty up the sound a little bit because the Voyager is sort of in the modern Moog territory where it's a little bit buttery and clean. So I like to add a bit of noise just to dirty it up a little bit. Moving on to the filter here. Uh, cutoff frequency is a little less than 12 o'clock, so it's a little bit closed. But again, I'm controlling it mostly with the mod wheel here, which has full control over the frequency there. Spacing I've set to zero. Spacing is cool when you have stereo outputs. If you choose a dual low-pass filter, you can actually hear the two filters spreading across the frequency spectrum with the spacing knob. So let me demonstrate that here. <laughs> So you should probably be wearing headphones for that demo or maybe have a nicely spread uh, speakers. Which adds a nice uh, stereo effect, which you don't find in a lot of monophonic analog synths. And finally, we get the resonance, and I have it set to roughly one o'clock here. And that's what gives it that kind of super funky, almost like a duck quacky sound. And that's probably the part that was a little controversial <laughs> and uh, what made it maybe a little too exaggerated and too kind of comically synthy. So if you reduce the resonance, you lose a bit of that liquidy kind of vocal sound. <laughs> And then you're back into more of a traditional instrument. In this case, I wanted to try to exaggerate the sound a little bit because I feel like with the switched on Bach series and tons of different like proper cello renditions of these suites, um, I wanted to do something a little bit different and take a bit of a risk and make it a little kind of weirdly funky and synthesizer-y, um, just to kind of step out of that sort of traditional norm. 
Um, and I may have s sort of swung the pendulum too far down one direction, but still fun to experiment. You can obviously exaggerate the resonance even more. In retrospect, probably toning down the resonance a little bit would have been slightly better here. And I should also mention that I've turned on Glide here, which probably also exaggerated some of that kind of funky sound. You can hear that the Glide kind of slews the notes together. And the Glide is set to a little more than 9 o'clock here. So if I turn off Glide, we would have had this sound. And finally, going over the envelopes here, I have the attack raised just a little bit so that I'm not getting a super clicky attack because uh, with the cello sound, you don't want to be too percussive uh, like an organ. The decay is set to sort of a mid-ish range sustain. Again, I didn't want it at zero because I didn't want the sound to go wow. I want it to sustain as I'm holding down the key. And then a bit of release just to um, help tie the notes together. So as I'm jumping around, it's not cutting off immediately, which would have been a little bit unnatural. Even that, even though that's how a cello would have performed as you raise the bow, the sound cuts off. And then I have a tiny bit of uh, contribution to the filter via the filter envelope here. So yeah, let's experiment with what it would have sounded like had I made it less funky. So the way to do that is reduce the resonance, obviously, and then remove the glide and then maybe even accentuate the envelopes to add a bit more attack. So now it sounds more like a bowed string. And maybe even creating the, a little more buzz in the other wave. Make it a little more subtle.
So yeah, that's what it would have been like had I tried to emulate more of a traditional cello. And it's sort of a fine line because as you, you're obviously never going to get a perfect cello sound out of a synthesizer. So there's sort of a spectrum as I like to see it. On one end, you have trying to emulate as close as possible an acoustic instrument. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you're going completely crazy and not caring about emulating anything. And I feel like if you go too far down the two spectrums, you get into cheesy territory in either direction. Uh, if you go, if you try to emulate it too perfectly, you, you're almost setting yourself up for criticism because you're never going to get it right and you're always going to get an almost cello, but it's always going to sound like a synthesizer cello, which is a little bit corny, uh, which is kind of what we have here as well. If you try to think of that as a cello, it's obviously like falls short, right? And But if you try to think of it like a synthesizer patch, then it sounds nice. Same thing on the other spectrum as well. If you go too crazy, like it's probably what I did, I probably felt too much on the other direction of making it, trying to make it too synthesizer-y and too kind of funky, um, which also could end up being a little bit comical. So it's a sort of a fine line where I'm trying to find that direction and I'm trying to swing the pendulum in both directions. Um, in the first Aria video, I feel like I was too conservative with the synthesizer patch. And in this one, I may have gone too far down the other direction. So as I'm trying to kind of swing the pendulum back and forth, hopefully eventually it'll kind of land in the middle. So while we have this patch, let's experiment with just different sounds. If I can crack up the noise. What if I made the oscillators more square waves? As you get it more into square waves, you're getting more into like a reed uh, instruments or just woodwinds in general. Whereas the sawtooth is more appropriate for the string uh, instruments, especially the hard bowing of a cello. And if you go into the um, triangles, you're getting more into like soft flutes. Especially with the little bit of noise, you get a sort of a flute thing and you can increase the attack to get more of that percussive flute. Let's hear what that would have sounded like. And if you bring up the other um, oscillator with um, a triangle wave much higher up, you get more into like a organ type sound. If I remove the release, you're gonna get that really organish. bring it all the way down and as you do these sort of um, swells of filter opens you get more of to like a soft brass like a French horn or something Voyager sounds lovely. It's such an expressive instrument. Um, on the surface, it's more of like a typical synthesizer. I mean, a typical advanced synthesizer because it's got two envelopes, two filters, three oscillators, etc. But beyond just the spec sheet, I mean, there's lots of synths that have like huge spec sheets and tons of different features. But for some reason, the Voyager to me is the most, out of the synths I have, it's the most like um, an acoustic instrument, if that makes sense. I've, I have the same feeling when I play in front of a piano or like a Rhodes or something. I have the same feeling here. I don't know if it's the like the wood, the kind of heftiness of it that makes it feel like an instrument. 
but I feel like a lot of it has to do with the keyboard and obviously the sound. I feel like once you find the sweet spot of expressive control uh, with the, the, the aftertouch and the mod wheel, it really turns into this really expressive synthesizer that kind of gets out of the way of performance. A lot of other synths, I feel like when I'm performing on them, tend to sort of have to not fight with the synth, but kind of... I have to think about how I'm playing to sort of appease the synthesizer and not the other way around. Whereas with the Voyager, I feel like it gets out of the way and I can fully express myself. And I feel like a lot of it has to do with the keyboard, to be honest. Honestly, I wish every synth had this keyboard. It would probably drive up the cost of most synthesizers. But as a keyboard player, like it's the keyboard means a lot. Anyways, uh, hopefully this was interesting. Stay tuned for more content and I'll see you guys in the next one.